This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Book Publishing Palooza. My friend Alfred Poor is here. Welcome to The Speaking Show. Thanks so much, David. A pleasure as always to speak with you. So you are a publishing veteran. You've done this every imaginable way, old school, new school, traditional publishing, self-publishing, entrepreneurial publishing. You even help other speakers and experts publish books, correct? That is correct. Yep. So we're going to dig into all of that. We're going to dig cool. deep. This is going to be a deep dive, archaeological dig into all the crazy stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly around publishing. Now, let's go back to the either good old days or bad old days. I'd love your opinion on that. Your very first book was about the HP LaserJet printer. It so was indeed. take us back to that experience and how all of that came to be. So back in the day, I was writing for PC Magazine a lot. I was a contributing editor. Later on, I became their first uh, lead analyst for business displays and display technology. So I had pretty good visibility among the public. Circulation was, you know, million plus on the way to two million, maybe. Pass along was maybe three to five million. So for each issue, and they came out every two weeks, you know, there was a, a fair amount of visibility there. And one of the things I did for PC Magazine was I actually wrote the first feature review of the first HP LaserJet when it first came out. You can go look it up and find out just how old I am, which is not quite old as dirt, but we're getting there. And because of that, somebody who has since become a great friend and colleague, a guy by the name of Joe King, who actually also helped start the longest running show about computers and technology in the country that continues to this day. It's called The Personal Computer Show, and it's on WBAI in New York City. Give them a little shout out. But he was working with somebody else who was publishing a series of books. And Joe says, there's this guy, Alfred Poor. Let's see if he'd write a book about the laser jet. And so I actually did not seek them out. They came and found me and said, you know, here, would you like to write the book? And came to terms and, and so forth. And just as a Burma shave sign along the road here, the point there is, again, I didn't find them. They found me. So that's where thought leadership you know, developing a reputation in your market, being visible, whether it's social media or magazine publications or websites or all that stuff, all that pays off. That's, you know, an investment that feels kind of intangible at the time, but I certainly would not have been given this book opportunity had it not been for all the magazine writing that I was doing. Now, let's talk about difficulty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, publishing back in the late 1980s, this was late 1980s, early 90s, when was it? So this first one was 89. Okay. So the traditional publishing world, which even back yep. then we called the New York publishers, that was really, really, really hard to get in there. If you were like, if you were a nobody, you mentioned re reputation, building your brand, building your platform. Man, I mean, if you think it's important today, it was really important back then because very, very few books got published. Did you have an agent back then or kind of how did that all unfold? So that's a really good question. And it's the bad old days continue to today. I mean, we still have legacy publishers. There are still people who are publishing books. And I'll tell you a little story about that one in just a minute. But for this first one, no, I didn't have an agent. And... Things might have gone a little differently had I had one. There was a few rough spots along the way that you know, took a little ironing out, but you know, they all worked out in the end. For my second book, I definitely had an agent. Now, so everybody thinks, okay, well, so the situation is the way you get a contract with a publisher then and now is you write a book proposal. And a typical book proposal, at the very least, is the title, sample table of contents, a long description about what the book is, who the audience is, you know, what the contents are going to be like, and also what other books are out there that are already in this space, and you know, what's the competition, and then what's your USP, you know, your unique selling point, what will you have that they don't that will give you an opportunity to 
you know, find a, a space in there. One of the important things here is that they want to make sure that there's an audience. And so my wife sells pottery. And when we're looking, you know, for, for potential craft shows for her to do, if we walk in and we don't see any potters, we know that's not a show for us, right? You don't want to be in a show that's, you know, half potters because the competition is going to be fierce, but you don't want to be in a show whether you're the only potter because that probably means pottery doesn't sell there. Right. So it's the same thing with book publishing. They're risk adverse. Book publishing is like investing. It's a race to be second. <laughs> Let somebody else break the trail and then come in and try to come in on their coattails and make money off of that. So you need to prove that there's a market and that you have an angle that's going to give you a leg up on that. And then you have to prove that you're the person who can do it. So resume, you know, your credentials and all that. And then for most people, you also have to submit a chapter or two. This is all on spec, right? So as a professional writer, that's thousands and thousands of dollars of my time and effort to write something that's going to get turned down. And so you write up these proposals and you send them out to the book acquisition editors. And months later, you hear back from them that, yeah, no, they don't want it. And so this is one place where an agent can make a huge difference because they've already got the contacts with the acquisition editors, the people who are actually going to say, yes, let's give this guy a contract. The problem is <laughs> getting an agent is probably more difficult than it is to get a book contract. If you've got a book contract, it already a little easier to find an agent. But again, they don't make money unless you do. And so they're not going to invest their time. It's just like a speaker's bureau. They're not going to invest their time in promoting you unless they're pretty confident that they're going to get money back out of it. Right. So after the first book, I went out and got myself an agent. Again, visibility, leadership, networking, writing with PC Magazine, I was rubbing elbows with really famous at that time people. And I was able to ask around and one of the senior editors actually referred me to his agent. And so I was able to approach her and she was willing to take me on. And incidentally, she never cost me a penny. Agents, if I recall correctly, they take 15%. Yeah. And in terms of what she saved me in grief and bad deals and, you know, problems with contracts and all that, she never cost me a single cent. In right. fact... She made me some money. I don't know if you know this, but I got paid not to write books. Oh, tell that story. <laughs> you did mention it, but go ahead and tell that story because that's great. So there was a book about, this was early days of online. And so I got a contract. My agent got me a contract with a major publisher to write a book about how to get online and what the different services were and how to use a modem and all that good old ancient history stuff. You can look uh, this up on Wikipedia, kids. Yeah, exactly. A modem. Exactly. Think about it. <laughs> a modem. And no, I won't do the sound effects. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, you're Same welcome. <laughs> I'll, I'll restrain myself. Okay. So I start doing the research and I'm getting everything pulled together and I've got you know, you know a lot of this stuff organized. And my agent got a letter from the publisher saying, oh, we've decided to change directions in our uh, you know technology publishing and we don't want the book after all. And she said, fine. <laughs> But my client gets to keep the half of the uh, advance that you gave him. And they said, well, wait, wait, he, you know, we never seen anything. We didn't get anything. She said, it doesn't matter. You, you know, he's done the work. You committed to it. He's committed to the project. So, you know, we'll call it quits if, you know, if he doesn't have to pay back the advance that you gave. And that's how it ended. And in fact, that happened to me another time. So probably the best money I've ever made is not writing books. There you go. However, well, it's tough to make it happen. Yes, yes. Speaking of grief, you mentioned a couple seconds ago about hassle and grief, which mm -hmm. brings, of course, the publishing contract as we're talking about. So the publishing contract to write a book, not mm -hmm. to not write a book, but the ones to write a book, that can be a hornet's nest also. Yes. Yeah. So and how does the book contract with the publisher work? And should we have a lawyer? And kind of how does all this, how do we make sure that we don't get ground up in the machine? The first thing to remember, as with professional speaking or, or anything else, a contract only exists for when the wheels fall off. When everything goes smoothly, it doesn't matter whether you have a contract or not. Everybody's happy. Everybody's making money. It's not a problem. It's only when things change or go wrong or you know somebody feels they're not getting what they thought they were going to get 
that the contract makes a big difference. And so it's always nice to have a lawyer look at it. But in my experience, again, if you have an experienced and you know, good, proactive kind of book agent working for you, chances are that she or he will know enough about contracts to know where the, the sticking points are and, and the things to watch out for and to avoid. One of the most important things for me as an author is what I call reciprocity. Hey, this interview is a real moneymaker. If you're serious about ramping up your reach and revenue as a speaker, trainer, or expert, book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team. The link is doitmarketing.com slash call. It will be the most valuable 45 minutes you invest in your speaking-driven business. Speaking of value, let's get back to the show. So one of the things you'll be signing away frequently in a book contract is Anything that goes wrong is your fault. <laughs> and, you know, they're not responsible. So the two things that I would always insist on if they weren't there, and sometimes they were, the one thing is that I don't mind being held responsible for any mistakes that I make, but I insist that any mistakes that they make in editing, you know, layout, whatever they do to it, if they change something and that becomes a liability, that's on them, not me. So I want them to take the same responsibility that they're asking me to take. And then the other one, and this is something that a lot of new authors don't understand and don't always insist on, that is the publishers have deep pockets compared to me. You know, I mean, uh, they're multi, multi multi-million dollar businesses, right? I'm perfectly happy to admit this, but I am not a multi-million dollar business. (laughs) So it's important that if there is a lawsuit, if somebody does come with a, a legal complaint, that there's a clause in the contract that says, so long as the publisher's interests and my interests are aligned, they will include me in their defense. And that's huge because having to get your own lawyer, having to take the time to go testify and, you know, do all that kinds of stuff can just put you in a deep hole. And they don't care. They're perfectly happy to do that. The the key thing being, as long as our interests are in alignment. Yeah. They're paying for lawyers lawyers anyway. anyway. Exactly. So that's a really important thing to look for. Now, the other part about the contracts are a lot of people don't understand how contracts work. (laughs) You write a book, you give it to the publisher, they print it, they get it to bookstores, and they send you money. It's really simple, except it's not. So the way authors make money on books is on what they call royalties, which is essentially a commission. All right. The publisher sells a book and you get a little piece of the action. All right. And it's percentage points. And typically it could be 5% of the wholesale, 10% of the retail price, different arrangements uh, are made differently, but it's usually in that kind of a ballpark. So on a $20 book, you might be making buck fifty two dollars per copy, depending on the terms. So that seems nice and straightforward. Do a print run of 6,000 books and send them out there. You're going to get some money. Well, not so fast. First of all, They send them out to the bookstore. The bookstores will order them from their catalog. And the bookstore will will pay for them wholesale. But the bookstores have time to return them for a refund. And this can be years. And in case of paperbacks, they don't return the books. They just tear the covers off and send the covers back for proof that they had the book. So there ends up being a book that can't be sold anyway. If you walk New York streets... Sometimes you'll find a, a card, somebody with a street vendor at a card table selling a whole bunch of paperbacks without covers, and that's where they came from. They did a dumpster dive behind a bookstore, brought them out, and are trying to get some money from them. So the publisher will keep what they call a reserve against royalties. So, you know, you sell 5,000 copies of your book, right? You know, $10,000 sounds pretty nice. However, they're going to keep three, four, five thousand of those dollars in the bank against the possibility of those books coming back. There's a great saying in Nashville, which music industry works on much the same way. And the pejorative saying in Nashville is, yeah, he, he shipped platinum, but he returned gold. Nice. Which means shipped a lot of them, but they all came back. Right. And so that's one of the problems with the royalties. Now, good authors in a good situation will get what they call an advance on royalties, which is the advance that I was talking about that I got paid for not writing the book. Okay, so I would get paid a certain amount. The contract would call for me to get a certain advance on the royalties. 
And so to write a book, I might get a $5,000 advance or a $10,000 advance. And that would help pay for the time that would cost me to invest to put the book together. Typically, the advances that I got back in the day were somewhere between half and a quarter or less of what I would make with my time doing other things. But it's one of those risk sharing arrangements. You know, if I write an article for a magazine, they pay me outright. They've got the article. I've got the money. We're done. You know, go dig another hole. With the book, I'm betting that the book's going to sell more. And so there's that upside of eventually going to be getting more money back than beyond the advance. Though the saying in the industry is, if you ever get a royalty check, your advance wasn't big enough. Nice. Now, the flip side of that, which is what my literary agent says, is, you know, because people will negotiate for more of an advance, more of a percentage. He says, advances don't sell books. No, they don't. And that's a great little piece of wisdom. People say, I only got a $10,000 advance, Alfred. This sucks. It's like, well, sell 200,000 copies of your book and don't worry, the rest of that money is going to come in. Exactly. But they're not going to front it to you if you're a no-name author. Or even if you are. You know, I mean, there's a a limit. Though, So the time for another story. So here, I've been in this business a while. So 1989, what is that? That's 30 years? Yeah. Coming up on 30 years since I wrote that book. Well, about two years ago, I got a call from a not-to-be-named major legacy publisher because my thought leadership and exposure and, and all that stuff was getting me to show up in some good magazines and get quoted places and things like that, all the kinds of things that we're trying to do. And this young fella, I think he was old enough to drive, called me up and said, we'd like to publish a book by you. And actually, it was by email. And so we exchanged emails a couple of times. And I said, well, you know, before we get deep into this, before I do a proposal, before we, you know, invest our time, your time and my time in doing this, let's just see if, you know, where we are in alignment about the project. And, you know, I had a couple of questions about, stand, you know, the typical contract arrangements. And I said, and so what do you typically pay as an advance? And he came back with the reply, oh, well, for new authors, we don't pay anything. Now, I've got more than a dozen books to my credit. And those are the ones that I've written myself or co-authored. That's not the places, all the places that I've contributed chapters and, and all that stuff. And for this <clears throat> young fellow to call me <laughs> a new author, pretty much brought the conversation to a polite but very quick end. You know, that was uh, the end of that. So the bottom line there is, it's not like the old days in that advances are much tougher to come by. If your name is King or... Um, John Grisham. Grisham, yeah, that would do it. You know, you're probably going to get an advance. Mm, eh, you know, Lee Childs, yeah, probably get an advance. But after that, it could be very tough, even with an agent, no matter how good you are. So keep that in mind. And another thing is that a lot of the things that the publishers used to do, they don't do anymore. You want a nice book cover? Yeah, you pay for that. Your book needs to be copy edited. You pay for that. And you want to get it marketed? Sure, we'll put it in our catalog. Oh, you want book tours? You pay for that. You arrange them, you pay for that. You know, we'll put a press release when it comes out, but you know, you want ads in, you know, your market? Chances are they won't do much for you there. So it's more than ever load a box of you know, a couple boxes of books in the trunk of your car and drive around and sell them. If you're looking to make money off a book as a straight up book sale kind of play, putting it in the bookstores. Yeah. Another thing to keep in mind is that, again, you know, you're getting that 10% on the retail, right? They're keeping 90. Now, a lot of that is print, you know, they're expensive to print them, expensive to ship around the country. They are doing marketing. They are getting them out to bookstores and they fill the orders and do a whole lot of things for you, but you're still getting the tiny slice of the pie. And we're going to get to alternatives to that before we're well, done. That's what I was going to say. Is that, Can we get a bigger slice of that we can pie get a bigger right slice of the can, pie. We, can we look at the sunnier side of the street perhaps? So, yeah, in a second. But so the reason for this is 60% of all books published by the legacy publishers don't pay out. In other words, don't make up the money that they invested in it. They lose money, that yeah, issue. they're losers. They lose money on 60% of them, which means the 40% have to make up the difference and then make some money for the business and then they can pay you something. So my problem with legacy publishing contracts 
is you probably won't get an advance. You get a tiny slice of the pie. They hold onto your money for three years or more waiting for the books to come back in case they do, if any went out in the first place. And so it's just a long, long stretch before you see the money. And for that reason, and many other reasons, I think it's really difficult for somebody to make a good living as a book writer. You know, if you're writing books and hoping that people will buy them and you'll make some good money on it, it's extremely different. Like it, difficult. It's like everything else. There's a pyramid and you've got the kings and the childs and the others at the, at the peak. And there's some journeymen people in the middle who write some books that, get, that sell pretty well. But then you've got this huge layer at the bottom of people just churning out books and churning out books and they don't go anywhere. So getting books into bookstores, just which is a dwindling marketplace anyway. You just look at how rapidly they close and how few independent bookstores there are. Sure, you can get on Amazon, but you know, just getting on the shelf in a bookstore where somebody's going to come in, browse it, and see your book and buy it, that happens a lot less than it used to. So there's a lot less going on with the traditional legacy publishing than there was in the past. And it was, wasn't all that great a deal anyway. I mean, I did write a couple books that did sell really well and helped put our kids through college. And so I'm not, certainly not complaining about that. But I don't think I will ever write a book for a publisher again. Wow, that's a pretty big statement. So let's talk about the self-publishing universe and some pros and cons there. So a little more than 20 years ago, I published my first book by myself. And this was before the days of print on demand. 20 years ago, that was no joke. That was really hard. Yeah. So I had friends in the industry and I asked around. I got a essentially a book coyote, (laughs) a guy who could steer me through the process and find me a printer and find me a binder and find me a, you know, all the shipping services and everything that I needed. So he was able to do the parts that I didn't know how to do. I wrote the book. I did the layout. I did the cover. I did everything. Got that all laid up in, as film. There was a, a, a process where you take pictures with a, a camera and special film, the same that they use for laying out newspapers and stuff. And you would get these films shipped off to the publisher and you wait and wait and wait And eventually a truck pulls up with a couple pallets full of boxes and you stick them in your garage. I think I had like a 6,000 copy print run because the first copy costs thousands of dollars. And then as you go up in quantities, the costs go down and down and down. And so you spend more and more until you get to the point where, okay, I think on my business plan, if I pay a dollar per copy, you know, I can make money on it. So a few years ago, about, I think it was a couple tons of those books went to the recyclers. And that sounds like a failure, but in fact, it isn't. I made good money off of that book in a bunch of different ways. Um, It was about Flight Simulator, which was at the time the most popular PC game ever. And I was very active in that community. And it was a book that did really well. And I self-published it. And that's when I realized, you know, this is not the greatest deal, but it's better than what I would have had if I'd gone with a regular publisher. Yeah. And then you go forward a few years and we get what's called print on demand. So instead of having to do that, come up with the films and all that stuff, you lay the book out on your computer and essentially you create a PDF like you would for just about any other document. And you can send that to a service and they will use laser printers that in a highly automated system that will print the book, put them together, put the covers on and ship them to you. And the beauty of it is they don't care whether you order 6,000 or 600 or six or even one. You can order them, you know, as many or as few as you want. The more you order, you know, the lower the price becomes because you do get some volume discounts on most of the services. And there is also a point at which if somewhere around, probably around four or 5,000 copies, if you're going to be printing that many, you're better going back to the traditional web press and printing them up that way. But you know, I've got one speaker who orders you know, 100 here, 200 there, 300 there, depending on what gig he's got going and what kind of arrangement he has. And he gets the books within a week in most cases. And he doesn't have any filling up his garage. He doesn't have to tie up money ahead of time. And you know, same for me. But in fact, and so the printing and shipping costs for a, one of my latest books... My one for college students and soft career skills, for example. For those of you on radio, I'm, I'm holding it up right now. There it is. Uh, so I call this my $5 business card. 
because printing costs, shipping costs, and then for me to mail them back out again, you know, it runs me about five bucks. And that's a lot more impressive to a prospect to get something like that in their hand right. than a little piece of cardboard. And I don't care if it's a Moo business card. This is still more impressive than an expensive Moo business card. So this print on demand has made a whole lot of these things much more accessible and much easier. And the nice thing is that there's lots of ways that somebody who doesn't know anything about book publishing be able to get this done. There's Create Space on Amazon, which is a, a way to do it. There's one service that I like a lot called Fast Pencil. And the beauty of that is it's sort of an a la carte system. So if you need editing, you can get editing. If you need layout help, you can get layout help. If you want to do those yourself, you can. And you sort of pay for the, the pieces of the service that you need. That's now, fastpencil.com. Fastpencil.com. Got it. Um, Lulu was another one. Yeah. But yeah, there are a number of print-on-demand services for the inexperienced publisher. So if you don't want to or need to learn all about publishing, this is a way to go. Well, and let's also talk about another way to go because you're a very humble guy and you also have this fantastic publishing program for entrepreneurial speakers and experts. Let's hear about what that looks like and what that sure. hand-holding process does for people. Okay. I don't mean to disparage anybody else who's out there in the business, but there are some other business models that may or may not be effective for people. But one of the typical things is they book coach and you'll pay them five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 and they'll help you to write your book in, in a weekend and they'll help you get it published and, 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 and. And here again, you're investing a lot of money out of pocket that maybe you'll get a return on down the line which is much more the old publishing model as opposed to this new lean, no intermediary kind of arrangement that print on demand gives you. So what I have started off with a good friend of mine who was writing a blog and I sent him some ideas and because he was writing it one a day and it was about networking and business meetings and stuff. And I sent him a couple suggestions and I said, okay, here's your entries for days 11 and 12. He says, oh, I've already got those written. These are going to be 23 and 24. I said, well, if you go to 31, then you've got one point for each day of the month. So this could be, you know, 31 days to better networking. And he loved the idea. So I ended up publishing a series of books for him that were 31-day mastery topics. And it worked out well for him. And we ended up, you know, I ended up suggesting it to some other speakers and came up with this system. Basically, the way I work is I don't charge anything. I'm in. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll it, take it. If it's free, it's for me, right? But the, you know, so the way it works is if the, you know, the speaker, they have to pay for their cover and they have to pay for the copy editing and so forth of the, of the book. But I'll do the interior layout. I'll take care of getting the ISBN number. I'll get it published. And the service that I use automatically puts it on Amazon, it automatically puts it on Barnes & Noble. You don't have to jump through any of those hoops. And so it's out there. You can point to it. And they get hard copy version and Kindle version. Well, I only print my books as hard copy. No you, Kindle version. No Kindle version. Wow, interesting. Well, well, again, I'm not so interested in the direct sales. Okay. Right? So You want the $5 business card. I want the $5 business cards. When I come to you as a meeting planner and say, okay, my fee is a little high on your budget. What can we do to add value? And you know, we've talked about this in my case before. I've had been in just this situation where I've been able to say, okay, well, I will sell you a copy of my book for every one of the, the participants at the event, and I'll give them to you at below wholesale cost. How about this for a fee and get more money that way? Higher than what I was asking that was too much in the beginning. And so if it's already out there as a Kindle that you can get for a dollar, it doesn't quite have the same... Interesting. So it undermines the perceived value if it's out there for a buck or a that's, free download. Yeah, that's my feeling. You know, it's a matter of what works for you, you know, what, how it fits into your business plan. And so basically, take care of all that, you know, get it published for you, and then can order the books for you because I'm the, I'll be the publisher. My company is the publisher, and then we can order books for you and have them sent wherever you want and uh, makes it easy. One of the nice things is that the service that I use has publication plants, printing plants around the world. 
And this one speaker that I've worked with, he called me up and said, I've got this gig coming up in Australia and I've been looking into it and it's really expensive to ship books to Australia. You know, it ends up doubling the cost or more to ship it. stuff. And you know, if you could do it by sea freight, you could do that and it costs a little less, but you know, it takes months and it's kind of iffy. And this is a hard stop event. You know, he's going to be on stage and if the books aren't there, they're no use to him. They show up a week later. And he said, what am I going to do? You know, do you have, do you have any bright ideas? I printed them in Australia. <laughs> Easy, done. That was probably pretty impressive to him. It was. He was very impressed. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. And, so go back to the part where this is free. Okay, What's so the revenue share on the back end? It's the revenue share on the back end. And again, if you write for legacy publisher, you get a buck and a half a book maybe, right? I wanted the deal to be what I want as an author. I don't want that publisher taking all that, you know, 85 cents for all the stuff they have to do. When in fact, they're not doing a whole lot except covering their losses on the losers that they've done. And so I flipped it. I take a dollar and a half per copy when you print them. Wow. Some, this is like the best deal going. Yeah. And the other thing about it is the minimum number of books that you need to order from me to do this, zero. So Some of those other coach kind of situations, you know, you can do this, but you know, you have to buy a thousand books as part of it. No. So it, mine is just zero. So I don't make money unless you make money, which is why most of the people who have come to me to publish books with me, I politely declined. And why is that? So now let's get into whether you work with me or not. Things you need to know about the book business. I'm going to share all the stuff about my strategy and what works. Some of this is original. Some of this I've learned from other people, sort of an amalgam. But this is how I view the world at this point. Give us the brain dump. Okay. So if you want a bookstore to carry your book, you have to give them at least a 50% discount and maybe more. And if you want them to carry your book, you also have to give them the right to return the book for a refund. That whole reserve thing and shipping platinum, returning gold. And you know, that's not your money until three or four years from now. And if you're doing this for yourself, you know, to have the bookstores come back to you and say, okay, here's the cover of your book, send us the money back. You know, that's really hard because you don't have the book and you lose the money that you've probably already spent. So again, for most of these kinds of books, people are not going to walk into the bookstore and buy them in any significant quantity. So what I recommend my authors do is give the bookstores the minimum discount that we can, which is 25%. So on a $20 book, they would pay $15, which when your print costs and shipping costs are you know, about five bucks, or maybe, you know, probably closer to $3, that's a pretty good profit for you. And you also say there are no returns. So this means that the bookstore will not stock it, but there's not a bookstore in the country that will say, if a customer walks in and say, I want to buy Newman's book, can you get me a copy? And they look in the Ingram catalog, which is the big wholesale catalog, and say, there's the book. You bet you they'll take that five bucks, right? Five bucks is more than zero. And five so bucks is five bucks. It's a guaranteed sale and they'll take it. So no returns, you know, you're getting maximum money out of it. And so if printing and shipping is about $3 a copy, you add the $1.50 for publisher fee, it's still about less than $5. So if you've got a $20 book, you're going to be making $10 a copy that's for the ones that sell through the bookstores and you don't have to do anything. Right. Okay. And again, it's automatically on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. And, and so it's all the same kind of deal there. And it means that if you're going to buy them to use as a sweetener for a deal or to sell in the back of the room, you know, you can set the price at $20, but you can charge anything you want. And if they're going to cost you $5 a piece, you know, that gives you a lot of latitude in terms of bundling them with other books or other materials that you might want to send. Yeah. Gives you a whole lot of flexibility in the back of the room, sales and other kinds of uses. So for me, I've got to see the person who I'm dealing with has a business and sees the book as being an adjunct to that, something that's going to have the power to raise both. And so if you're a brand new speaker and you don't have any engagements lined up or you, you know, you're still figuring out what the business is, probably is not going to work for me. 
And if it's a, a situation where you're just hoping to write a book that's the best book about sales or leadership or you know stress or whatever your topic might be, dog training. You just want to get it into your dog training. You want to get it in the bookstores and sell a lot through the bookstores. That's wonderful, but that's not the business that I'm in. So that makes sense. Huge, 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 huge. Well, I've got two final questions for you. The final, final question is going to be, how do people get connected and stay connected to your empire? <laughs> we'll have all those show notes and the links and Alfred's empire all linked up uh, below this uh, show when you go to thespeakingshow.com. But even before I get to that question, if folks were to take one big idea out of our conversation today, what would you hope that idea would be? That a book can be an extremely powerful piece of the puzzle in terms of generating revenues for a professional speaker. A book on itself probably is not a business. I love that. You don't need a book, you need a book strategy. Right, and one of my favorite sayings is, every speaker needs a book and every book needs a speech. Amen, I love that for sure. That's the synergy. That's where, that gives you the idea of how each supports the other. And each opens doors for the other to make other things possible. You know, to be able to go to a meeting planner and say, oh, this topic, da, 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 da. Oh, I wrote the book, by the way. You know, that sets you apart from 90% of the other people who are, you know, sending in proposals for that because they don't have a book on that. Right. And so just as a credential, it's valuable. For sure. And I love that the speech builds the book and the book builds the speaking. Do we have time to get into something, one of my pet peeves? If it's a quick pet peeve, then yes. All right. Amazon bestsellers? Sure. Okay. I know so many people who are struggling and making this big deal about getting to be number one in some Amazon category so that they can claim being a bestseller. For 15 minutes on a Tuesday night at 2 a.m. In one of 30 or 300,000 categories. I know firsthand for a fact that at least one. Amazon bestseller reached that status with fewer than 70 book sales. As a result, New York Times bestseller, that means something to me. You know, if you want to brag that, that's impressive. I'll take it. It's not as impressive as it used to be, but it's still impressive. But I've got to say, for me, bragging about an Amazon bestseller is actually a negative these days because it means either you don't understand how little it means or you do know how little it means. And you're going to make a big deal out of it anyway. In either case, I'm going to have my shields up when I'm doing this. You're either an egomaniac or you're delusional. Right. Or you're a delusional egomaniac. Right, right. Possibly. All right. But it's just, you know, that ship has sailed. I would encourage anybody who's been thinking about doing a book to not play the Amazon bestseller game. Because I don't think it gives you any points. And again, I think it can be a detraction from the reputation, the credentials that you're trying to build. Fantastic. So, so, little so rant. be warned, folks, the best game to play is not the Amazon game. It's the write a great book game. Write a great book. It's a whole lot better to sell 100 books to people who are going to read it and care about it and talk to others about it and, and enhance your reputation than it is to burn 100 copies on Amazon in an attempt to get a, a bestseller. Yeah, you probably saw the headline, Alfred, that there was uh, someone did a big investigative journalist uh, piece on this, and they put a sweat sock, a used dirty sweat sock (laughs) on Amazon, and the used dirty sweat sock became an Amazon number one bestseller. I did not see that, but I will send you the link. I I will send you the link, and you will smile, and you're like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Exactly. All right. So how can people get connected and stay connected to Alfred Poor, the speaker, Alfred Poor's entrepreneurial publishing empire, and anything else you'd like to share? And we're going to link those up in the show notes as well. Sure. So I don't make a big deal about this book publishing thing. With that said, the easiest way to reach me is through my email, which is apoor at verizon.net. As you know, I've got about 50 other email addresses, but that's the one that is most reliable, works the best. I've been a Verizon customer so long that my bellatlantic.net address still works, but we'll stick with the current one, verizon.net. And I'm Alfred Poor on all the social media channels that you know you could find me at Twitter, Google, plus Facebook, LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to me to connect. If you do reach out to me on LinkedIn, tell me 
how you know me. Don't use the LinkedIn default. I heard you on the speaking show. That's what you guys need to say to Alfred. Exactly. And then I can come back to David and say, oh, wow, people are really listening. But yeah, because I get, as you may imagine, I get lots of requests for Facebook friends and for LinkedIn connections and all that. And if I don't know you and if I don't know the connection, I'm not going to be doing it. So give me a break and let me know what the connection is. But again, aportverizon.net is the email that's the most reliable and easiest way to get in touch with me. And you don't even need to get in touch with me if you are necessarily wanting to have me publish a book for you. If you've got questions about book publishing, any friend of David's is a friend of mine. And so feel free to write me a question. If there's something that you didn't quite get in what we've talked about here, feel free to follow up with me. I am standing on the shoulders of giants. Got a lot to pay forward. So I'm happy to do it. And Alfred means that 100%. He is a tremendously generous guy and uh, please take him up on that offer. Now, fun fact, closing fact, I actually remember my CompuServe ID. So if you guys want to contact me, I am 73247,731 at CompuServe.com. Very nice. Do you remember some of your old like Prodigy, AOL? I've, I've got my CompuServe addresses, both my Ziff Davis one and my private one. Oh my gosh. I haven't, haven't looked them up in years, but I still have them written down. 73247, 731. I'm expecting email, people. I'm expecting email. <laughs> Hook me up. Text only. <laughs> All right, Alfred. Thank you, my friend. Awesome, awesome episode. You're the best, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I'm glad to help. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 